Hello and welcome to the Fish House Nation podcast and catch cover live. Today, our guest is Joe Henry from the Lake of the Woods Tourism Bureau. Joe, thanks for joining the show today. Chris, how you doing? Just living the dream, man, every day, every day. <laughs> hey, uh, you spend a lot of time up there, obviously. You're based on Lake of the Woods. Uh, believe it or not, we do have a bunch of people that are getting into ice fishing for the first time. I've been working a few shows this year, and it's been incredible to me how many people are just getting into this sport. And we're talking ice fishing on Lake of the Woods today. Can you just give our audience kind of an overview of what Lake of the Woods is all about? Yeah, I sure can. You know what? Uh... So the, be the best way to explain Lake of the Woods is a big body of water. It's a big system. Um, I like to break it up into three parts. Um, the first part's the Rainy River, and the Rainy River feeds Lake of the Woods. You know, the Rainy River comes out of uh, Rainy Lake over at International Falls, and it flows straight west for about 60 miles until it hits the town of Badat, Minnesota. And then it turns straight north and goes 12 more miles before it enters Lake of the Woods. That's actually the Rainy River is our international dividing line with Canada as well. Halfway across that river is the international line. So you got the Rainy River that feeds Lake of the Woods. That's one part of our fishery. The second part is Big Traverse Bay. And Big Traverse Bay is a great big open water of Lake of the Woods that you think of. Um, for all practical purposes, it's about 30 miles north-south by about 25 miles uh, east-west. And then the third part of Lake of the Woods is the Northwest Angle. And that's that little tip of Minnesota that sticks up into Canada. Uh, that's the northernmost point of the contiguous United States. And that's also where the 14,552 islands of Lake of the Woods begin. So it's a, qu quite a diverse fishery. Uh, a couple other things I'll mention about Lake of the Woods that make it unique. Big Traverse Bay, the deepest spot in that whole bay with all that water uh, is about 38 feet deep. So really the whole thing is prolific um, and, and holds life. You know, we always kid around, we say, if you, you could take a push pin and put it anywhere on Lake of the Woods in the wintertime, assuming it's deep enough water, you know, deeper water, but anywhere on that lake, you could probably go there and catch a fish, ice fishing. It's, it's that good of a fishery. I think the other thing that's interesting about it is that the water is stained water, which means the walleyes and saugers primarily bite during the day. Yeah, you'll get a you'll get a after dark bite once in a while, but as a rule, those fish will be active during the day. And of course, that makes it nice for most most anglers. I think the other thing is when you talk about ice fishing and people maybe that don't ice fish a whole lot, or maybe they're not hardcore. You know, we're lucky because the whole basin, with the exception of some reefs, but the majority of the basin is made up of flat mud. And those walleyes and saugers are roaming throughout that flat mud. That means that you can set up in an area and not necessarily have to be, you know, uh, exactly on the spot on the spot. Or maybe you're not on a spot that those fish only come, you know, for, for 45 minutes during the day when the sun's coming up or going down. It's, it's much more where you're going to set up out in that water and those fish are going to be roaming through periodically and, and you'll be good to go. So you kind of feel like anywhere is a good spot when you're out on, on uh, Big Traverse Bay. Well, I don't, you know, I don't know that anywhere is a good spot. There's certainly spots that are better than others based on where the the forage is, you know, where the fish are living, things like that. My only point is that, you know, when you, you know, a lot of times when you have a huge lake like Lake of the Woods. I mean, Chris, to give you an example, if Lake of the Woods was a Great Lake, it would it would be the sixth largest Great Lake with um, over sixty five thousand miles of shoreline over a million acres of water. I mean, it's big water, you know, if you include the Canadian side of it. And um, it's the, 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 the big basin, 30 miles by 25 miles wide, that the whole thing is prolific. We don't have spots that are 250 feet deep in gin clear water. So there's not life living there. I mean, the whole darn thing is full of life. Certainly some spots are better than others. In, in fact, and that's also why, you know, we have resorts um, or if it's even just individuals using their wheelhouses, you know, they're, they're constantly trying to stay on top of those walleyes, following them around. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to talk to, to you about, uh, Joe, is there's a lot of different ways to visit Lake of the Woods. And one of the ways is to just stay in a resort and go out during the day. And then you've got the folks who rent uh, houses out on the lake, overnight houses. And then there's obviously a lot of people who bring their own wheelhouse. Can you kind of talk about those different ways to visit and kind of what's the, the best or not necessarily what the best, but what the advantages and disadvantages of each one are? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, it, it really has to do with you and, and what kind of equipment do you have? What kind of know-how do you have and how much work do you want to put into it? Because when it's all said and done, you know, when you use the resort services, you're, you're paying for some services. You're paying for um, their hard work. You're paying for them to monitor an ice road, get out there before light, make sure the ice trail is good and safe. Uh, you're paying for them to check on you throughout the day. They're constantly moving their fish houses, drilling the holes, banking the houses. Um, in some cases, they're transporting you out to the fish houses. Uh, they're cleaning your fish, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you, you know, one of the cool things, Chris, about ice fishing is that if you have your own stuff and you know what you're doing, man, come on up and, you know, whether you, you stay in, a, in your own wheelhouse out on the ice and enjoy that fishery, God bless you. It's, it's a wonderful fishery and you certainly can do that. Um, we have a lot of ice roads on Lake of the Woods. You pay a small fee to get access for the work that the, the providers of plowers and things like that have put into that road, and you have access to Lake of the Woods. The other part of that is if, if you don't have all that equipment and all that know-how, you know, it really isn't that darn expensive to go and be able to say, hey, you know, I'm going to stay with this resort. Um, I'm going to wake up in the morning, have a nice breakfast. Either I will drive myself out to their heated fish house that the holes are drilled out, it's banked, and it's ready to roll. Either I can drive myself out on one of their ice roads, and they might say, you know, you're seven miles out. You'll see a sign that says walleye way and make a left turn, and house number 21 is the third house on the right. You can't miss it, you know. Uh, or some of our resorts will actually take you out in their own ice transportation, whether it's a bombardier, whether it's a track rig, maybe it's a light ice rig. They'll take you out and deliver you right to the door where there's no roads at all. And uh, they'll drop you off at the front uh, the front door of that fish house, check on you throughout the day. And at the end of the day, at about 4.30 when it's getting dark out, they'll pick up you and your bucket of fish and they'll bring you back in just in time for happy hour. Yeah, come in and have a nice steak and maybe an old-fashioned. It sounds like a pretty good time. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting too. You know, if you want, um, many of the resorts will even cook up your fresh catch. And it's, it's kind of neat because... You know, these resorts have per, per, uh, perfected the shore lunches and, and, and the fish fry. And they all have their famous batter. They have their famous tartar sauce. In some cases, they'll cook it a few different ways for you. You might want it uh, traditionally fried. Maybe you want it broiled. Maybe you want it Cajun. There's lots of ways to get it done. A lot of ways to get it done. A lot of resorts up there, Joe. I know uh, you work for the Tourism Bureau, so you've got a, you know, a lot of people that are helping you out. But you talk about a few of the resorts uh, that kind of highlight the area and some places that, that people maybe know about or not know about. That's political suicide. I know it's tough. <laughs> but, uh, no, and I'm it, happy it, to. I am, I'm, I'm just kidding around. We do have, so we have, you know, uh, about 60 different lodging facilities up at Lake of the Woods. And, you know, we have everything from... Um, sleeper fish house outfitters that that work you know, that uh, are in business just during the winter, and we have um, Airbnbs and VRBOs. We have um, hotels. We have small resorts that don't have a bar and restaurant. We have you know small resorts that have a cute little tavern and, and, and you know maybe bar food, all the way up to the really the, the the larger resorts that offer very nice accommodations, the most modern accommodations you can imagine. Um, they offer a full menu, buffets, prime ribs, seafood, steaks. I mean, so really there, there's a little bit of, of something for everybody. You know, uh, obviously based on the frills you, you get and, and, and the services that you, you ask for, uh, that'll change the price of what you're, what you're looking for. But really everything is available. Some of the, some of the names, boy, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but I'll mention some of the names. You know, when you go up to the Northwest Angle, we have about uh, – uh, 14 resorts up there, eight of them ice fish during the winter. So you're talking about resorts like, you know, Flag Island Resort, Sportsman's Oak Island, Sunset Lodge. Um, gosh, I'm going to miss them here. You know, uh, uh, Jake's Northwest Angle, Young's Bay, uh, Angle Outpost known as Red Fox. You know, um, we have Bay Store uh, on Oak Island. We got, I mean, there's just a whole bunch of resorts up there that you can go ice fishing with. Um and then, of course, when you come down to the south end, you know, the whole south end is covered with resort, as well as the Rainy River. And, you know, the Rainy River resorts won't always use the river for an access point to get out on the lake. They will late in the year when the ice is good on the river. But early in the year, they just go over to Four Mile Bay and, and access the lake that way. And, gosh, we have, I mean, you know, Arneson's Rocky Point, Zippo Bay Resort, Morris Point, Cyrus. You know, we got Ken Marquis, Bugsy's. 
uh, Wigwam, Wheeler's Point, Lake Road Lodge, Sportsman's, Ballard's, Borderview, um, Riverbend, Slim's, uh, uh, Adrian's, um, you know, I'm missing a whole bunch of them. You know, coming into to, in the town of Bedette, you got the Walleye Inn, you got the American, you got the Bada Motel, uh, you got the Royal Dutchman just east of town. So there's really uh, a lot of different places to, to stay when you're up at Lake of the Woods. Um, you know, and, and really, I, I want to stress this too, Chris. You know, there's something for every budget level. You know, we are not that cosmopolitan area where, you know, gosh, I know some areas that, you know, you go to and it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars a night just to stay overnight. And, you know, we're not that way. We, we have a lot of different options for a lot of different people. If you want to bring your own stuff up and do it yourself, that's great. If you want to rely on the, the resorts to, to do the work when it's 25 below zero and get things fired up and make it nice and easy for you, that's also wonderful. A lot, lot of options. Yeah, just put your website up. It's lakeofthewoodsmn.com, and you can find uh, kind of all those accommodations and, and where they sit and kind of what some of the, the places, what some of the things that they offer at those places. Uh, Joe, how about the fishery? I mean, we kind of talked about walleyes. That's, you know, it's the walleye capital of the world, place mm -hmm. to go to chase walleyes. Tell us a little bit about the walleyes on Lake of the Woods. Yeah, you know, well, the first thing I'll say is that it helps, you know, they estimate we have about 10 million walleyes in our lake. Now, who knows exactly what, what the true number is, but the point of it is we we are a natural, you know, walleye fishery that keeps reproducing year after year. And that, number one, that's going to put the odds in your favor. You know, you're going to go to Lake of the Woods and, you know, you're, you're probably going to catch some fish. It's just a matter of how many and how big. Uh, not only do we have walleyes, we have big walleyes. And, you know, you, you always have a chance of catching a 28 to a 32 inch, 33 inch walleye. And that, those are big walleyes. Those are trophy class walleyes that start at about eight pounds and go up. Um, you know, what makes a good walleye fishery? What makes a big fish fishery when it comes to walleyes? You need a few things. Um, the first thing you need, Chris, is you need the right gene pool in your system. And certainly Lake of the Woods has the right gene of walleye. Uh, I, I fish a lot of lakes fishing walleye tournaments and things. And there's some lakes where if you catch a really big walleye, it's 27 inches. Nothing wrong with the lake. It's just that's what the gene pool is in that lake for walleyes. Um, so we have a good gene pool for big fish. Second thing you need is you need big water. And uh, the third thing you need is, you know, the right forage base. And not only do we have a lot of forage. So, you know, when a fishery has an issue, oftentimes it's not a fish issue. It's a forage issue. And we're so lucky. Man, between, I mean, I'll just list a few off. Yellow perch, emerald shiners, perch minnows crayfish, bloodworms, you know, uh, tulipies. You know, those tulipies are vital to producing big fish, whether it's pike or walleyes. You know, uh, they say that on Lake of the Woods, when a walleye becomes about 25 inches long or about five pounds, their diet really shifts over to tulipies. Not that they won't eat other things. They certainly will. But they really will focus on tulipies when they start to get, to get to be bigger walleyes. A tulipy is such a high source of protein for walleye. It's almost like a cheeseburger. It makes those fish grow bigger, faster. And we think that's a, you know, a big plus. I think the other thing that makes Lake of the Woods a, a big fish fishery is the fact that we have a slot limit on our lake. So the slot limit is, is, of course, the overall limit on Lake of the Woods is that you can keep six fish per day. A combined limit of walleyes and saugers is six. Up to four of those can be walleyes. And then there's a slot limit for the walleyes. 19 and a half inches to 28 inches, you must return to the water immediately. And you can keep one fish over 28 per day. Well, you know, that 19 and a half to 28 inch slot, we absolutely love it because that has created not only a, a big fish fishery, it's created a sustainable walleye fishery. You know, last year in Lake of the Woods, we had 2.9 million angling hours on our ice. You know, with that kind of fishing pressure, you know, if those 25 inches were going home in coolers, it wouldn't be good. So the fact is, get a nice picture of that big fish. The fact is, you're catching the big fish, which is great. It's fun. Get a nice picture. Return that fish safely to the water, and that fish is going to reproduce for years to come. So if people want to get their photo for their IG, for their Instagram. They can do that. But uh, the nice thing is, too, is you, know, you catch a bunch of those 15 inches. Those are great frying pan walleye. They're, they're actually better than those bigger fish. You know, I mean, remember, you can keep up to 19 and a half. And, you know, what most people do is if they get some bigger fish, they try to keep those for take-home fish. And they, they keep their smaller walleyes and, and saugers and such for, for eating when they're up there doing fish fries. But uh, 
I should say too, you know, the other bonus we don't talk about so much are the saugers. You know, that's a cousin to the walleye and they're usually a little bit smaller. Man, they taste incredible. They're just like a walleye. And, you know, if you don't have walleyes cruising underneath you during the day, uh, for whatever reason, maybe they're, maybe they have locked shot because it's a cold front. Maybe they're not swimming under you readily. Maybe whatever. Sure is nice having those saugers around. I mean, that really adds to the day. I mean, you're getting, uh, your bobbers are popping down. You're getting action on your electronics. I mean, it really makes for a good day. Heck, there's days where you'll whack the heck out of the walleyes. There's other days where you might catch just a few walleyes, but boy, I'll tell you what, thank goodness for those saugers. You bring in, uh, you know, a whole bunch of saugers and you've had a great day. Yeah, and some tasty walleye fingers out there on, on the lake. Uh, we've been talking walleye, and we're going to talk walleye some more, but let's talk a little bit about some of the other species on the lake. I know a lot of people go up there for big pike. Yeah, yeah. Big, well, I'll tell you, we, we're so lucky. You know, when you take a look at the United States, how many places can you go where you truly have, you know, a, a world-class trophy pike fishery? When I say a trophy pike, Chris, I'm talking pike that are over 40 inches, 40 inches and above. And Lake of the Woods absolutely is that, that fishery. You know, um, the DNR keeps track of the pike. They, they do test nettings every few years. And uh, our numbers are just super, super strong. It's really kind of interesting. The pike really get the most attention in March. And, you know, that's when people are tip-up fishing them. I and, you know, the reason I think they get the most attention in March is because, you know, pike don't school typically. But they do get congregated in March because they're going to be going into these spawning areas. So they get congregated in what they call the pre-spawn areas. And that might be areas that are adjacent to bays, adjacent to shorelines where they, they spawn, things like that. So, of course, ice anglers are out there in March and they're using, you know, great big dead baits on quick strike rigs. They're using live suckers and typically tip-up fishing. And normally uh, you're going to get some big pike. Are you going to get the fish over 40 inches? That's always hit and miss. But I'll tell you something, uh, there's a lot of them in our system. There's a lot of big pike, period. You know, there is uh, the limit on pike on Lake of the Woods if you want to keep some. You can keep three pike per day. And the slot limit is 30 to 40 inches. You must return to the water. So, again, those those pike that are 30 to 40, you put them back. That way, And you can keep one over 40 per day if you'd like. So uh, that's going to allow you to catch those fish that are 40, 45 inches. There's some huge, huge pike on Lake of the Woods. What's interesting is they really get a lot of attention in March, yet ice anglers catch them all year long. There, there are a small group of people that will target them with tip-ups, you know, throughout the winter, um, even though you know, other than March. And, and they typically do pretty darn good. Those fish are a little more spread out, so they might not get as much action, but they certainly do, uh, do well enough fishing those pike uh, that they, they keep doing it. So you're talking about March. Let's talk about season dates. I know you've thrown out some different uh, slot limit numbers, but uh, how about season dates up on Lake of the Woods? I know uh, a lot of people tend to move off of Mille Lacs uh, when the walleye season ends there. What, what's it like up on Lake of the Woods? Yeah, you know, uh, so as a rule, you know, and Mother Nature always determines, right? But but as a rule, um, our resorts started getting out their day houses, which are not the big sleepers, but the, the houses that might fit four or six people for fishing during the day. They normally get those those day houses out right around December 10th, give or take. Of course, every year is different based on ice conditions. But December 10th is kind of a go-to time. And usually that early ice is really good. And then, you know, we ice fish all the way through the winter. And then, you know, being that we're border water with Canada, we get an extended season. Um, first off, you know, in re the rest of Minnesota, the majority of the fish houses have to be off by the end of February. Um, you know, up at Lake of the Woods, we get a whole extra month. So March 31st, you know, is the day that you can leave your... Uh, fish house overnight on the ice up on Lake of the Woods, March 31st. So all of March is fair game for fishing, and it's usually a very good month. Um, on top of that, you know, uh, our ice, our walleye season is extended. So again, most of the state, you know, you can only fish uh, towards the end of March, uh, February for walleyes, if not before. On Lake of the Woods, our walleye season goes all the way to, to April 14th. So you can fish walleyes and saugers all the way to April 14th which is a nice extended season. Our pike season never closes. It's open year round. So really some nice opportunities to get out early and also to get out on that ice in March when a lot of other places are uh, are starting to shut down. All right. Uh, we've got a few questions coming in. If you've got questions for Joe Henry, go ahead and drop them in the comments and we'll get to those. Uh, we've been talking walleye. We've been talking northern. There's some other species out there. And, you know, this YouTube thing is getting bigger and bigger and people are seeing these other things coming out of the water. And uh, a lot of Canadians. So we're seeing some fish from over there. 
Uh, mm -hmm. How about uh, burbot in the U.S. waters? Is that uh, something that you guys see in your neck of the woods? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we catch a lot of eel pout. Eel pout, burbot, yeah, whatever you want to call them. But, you know, it's funny, Chris, because back in the day, many years ago, you know, people would catch burbot and they would throw them on the ice. And you'd go around and see frozen eel pout everywhere. In fact, you know, I can remember going out when I first started going to Lake of the Woods. I remember driving out and I'm looking out and there's no fish houses or nothing. And there's a guy an ice angler fishing all by himself in the open. I'm like, what the heck? Why is he out there? I don't even see a snowmobile. Well, here it wasn't an ice angler. It was a huge bald eagle. And it was hunched over eating one of the frozen berber that was on the ice from a from an ice angler. We, you know, I think probably because of uh, the popularity of, of uh, you know, the, the uh, ice fishing uh, deal in Walker and, and on Leech Lake and, you know, uh, all that stuff. You know, people have realized that those burbot or, or eel pout are really a freshwater cod and they can taste pretty darn good. So what's happened is over time, people have realized that, man, those bourbon, if you cook it the right way, some people will, they normally take the back straps off a of bourbon and also the tail meat. And a lot of times they'll cube it and they'll boil that in either um, salt water or maybe seven up and they dip it in a melted butter. And it's almost like poor man's lobster, they call it. Um, another thing is some people will just fry them up with batter or broil them, and they really like them that way also. So people have realized that, man, those eel pot are actually really good eating. Um, so, you know, it goes from throwing them on the ice as a junk fish, which I'm not even saying was legal from the DNR's perspective, but people, that's what they did. They threw them on the ice. Now, a lot of people are saying, man, I hope I catch some eel pot when I'm up there along with my walleyes. And, and oftentimes they will. You know what? Uh, uh, the, th the, the interesting thing about eel pot is, you know, people say they wrap around your arm. Well, they really don't wrap around your arm. What they do is when you grab them, they're, they're like an eel. You know, they, they might curl a tail up. It's hard to get one to go straight for a good photo op. You know, they, they always have their tail curled up. I had to laugh. I was at a sports show, uh, and I was talking to some guys from the Twin Cities, and they really don't ice fish much, and they came up to Lake of the Woods, and they stayed in a sleeper all four of them did over you know, a few nights, you know. And, and one of them talked to me, and he goes, man, I'll tell you, the first time I ever caught an eel pot, it kind of freaked me out. You know, at first I was kind of a weird looking fish. I was kind of afraid to grab it. And, you know, I just kind of had my arm out and I got it off and it was weird. It was squirming in my hand and, you know, I let it go. And I got to tell you, I went to, I went to sleep last night and I'm laying in that top bunk. And I'm thinking about that eel pot and I couldn't sleep. So I got down and put covers on all the holes and went back to bed. <laughs> you never know what might happen out there. You know, you got to well, you know, those eel pot, you know, they're notorious for climbing out of those holes and attacking people. Right. Well, you know, one of one of my favorite YouTube anglers out there is Jay Siemens, and he's a he's on the Canadian side, and he's in different type of waters, but he's always you know chasing down these lake trout out on on Lake of the Woods. I'm I'm gonna guess uh, in, in our waters that's probably not something to be found. Uh, you probably need to go to Canada for that. But you want to get into that for just a moment? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, uh, Lake of the Woods is a great lake trout fishery. The majority of lake trout fishing is done. Uh, you know, over in Canada and primarily Whitefish Bay is a great area for it. And, you know, we have uh, we have guides uh, on the U.S. side that will uh, will take you via snowmobile and uh, they'll actually take you over and catch lake trout on uh, uh, on the Canadian side if you want to experience that. And I'm sure there's good Canadian guys. You can drive up there and do that as well. And, you know, uh, it's it's a great lake trout fishery. We get we get a few lake trout um, during the winter, you know, and kind of accidentally. And I think what happens is, you know, with with a layer of ice on the lake. The water temperatures are quite stable, so those lake trout can stay in that, you know, 33, 34 degree water and pretty much cruise the whole lake. We get a few of them that get lost. They come down to the south end and walleye anglers will catch them. And so we all see a few every year that people hold up lake trout from Big Traverse Bay, but it's not the norm. No normally you catch those lake trout up in Canada. And I'll tell you what, I know uh, I know some guides from the Northwest Angle that just love doing it. And uh, boy, they get some big fish and it's just, uh, just a hoot. All right, that uh, leads us. We've got a couple here from Barb Carey, Captain Barb Carey. She's been on the show uh, a few times before. Uh, she says, great perch fishing there. You want to talk about the perch fishing on Lake of the Woods? Yeah, yep. You know, uh, um, yeah, Barb, uh, you know, she's been up Lake of the Woods many times. Uh, good friend, uh, women on ice and uh, uh, Wisconsin women fish. But, you know, I'll tell you, um, our perch fishing, really perch isn't a, a species that we really target. However, what ends up happening is, when you're fishing your walleyes and your saugers, there's a real good chance that you could catch some perch mixed in. And normally when you do, they are just sleds. I mean, I'm talking great big humpbacks, real wide bodies. Because of that stained water, they're real green with orange fins. And uh, 
um, you'll get them 13, 14, sometimes 15 inches for perch. And a lot of times you'll be pulling up a perch and thinking it's a decent sized walleye or sager. And you get it up to the, holy man, it's a big perch. Get that thing, you know, and they are huge, real, real big bodies on them. And uh, they're, they're a treat. You know, a lot of people that have uh, caught perch up a lake of the woods ha and have mounted them just because the colors are so brilliant because of that stained water. So, you know, we don't get them by the buckets full like some fisheries do, but boy, I'll tell you, we have a good population of them. And a lot of times you'll catch them, you know, while you're fishing your walleyes and saugers. Uh, you've been talking a little bit about that Northwest angle. I know last year uh, with everything going on with COVID and the, the border closures, it was difficult to get up there. There was an ice road going up there. Yep. Uh, Barb, once again, I'll ask a question. She wants to know they're going to have that ice road going up to the Northwest angle again this year. Yeah. You know what? We, we don't, and I can't speak for all the resorts. Really, it's it's their decision on, on what happens with that ice road. I simply you know, help them out in different ways. You know, I, I believe that we probably are not at this point going, going to have the ice road. Uh, and I'll tell you why is because, number one, you know, we do have access to the Northwest Angle a number of different ways right now. First off, you are allowed to travel up there through Canada. Now, if you travel through Canada, you know, for those that don't know, when you travel that little tip of Minnesota, that Northwest Angle, when you drive to the Northwest Angle via land, you actually go through 40 miles of Canada and then you enter back in to the U.S. up at the Northwest Angle. And, you know, because of that, you, you know, you need to have your credentials. So you need to have a passport, a passport card, an enhanced Minnesota or enhanced driver's license. Minnesota is one state that has those. Or you can use a driver's license combined with a, uh, a birth certificate. We'll get you across the border. Now, that's one thing you need. Since COVID and since the uh, Canadian border opened up um, most recently on August 9th to Americans traveling by land, you also need to be vaccinated. So what you need to do is you need to upload the Arrive Can app, just a free app on you know, Google Play Store or on uh, Apple iTunes. So you, you download this app called Arrive Can app, and then you upload your vaccination card to that. And then you also need, at this point in time, it might change down the road, but right now you still need a, a COVID test that's a PCR or molecular test that has a negative result that's less than 72 hours old. So you get a COVID test, you have your, you, you got to be vaccinated, of course, and then uh, you have your other credentials for crossing over the border and you, you can upload those things to this Arrive Can app. And then when you get up to the border, it's smooth sailing after that. You just get across, drive 40 miles through Canada and then you know, enter up to the Northwest Angle. When you're, uh, when you're up there fishing or, or whatever you're doing, snowmobiling, whatever, um, you can be up there a few days. And when you come back, the Canadians are not requiring you to have a new test. So your, your initial test you use to go up there for COVID will work coming south. Now, there is talk. In fact, there's a, a, a press conference today. They are talking about making that, um, that test not have to be a PCR test, which would make it a lot easier. You know, if, if it doesn't have to be a PCR test, people could pick those up, I think, I just spoke to somebody that said I picked up two test, a two test, a two test pack from Walgreens for twenty five bucks, and you can get a test result in fifteen minutes. So if they change that, that'll make life a lot easier. So that's one way to get up there, going through the the border. Now, we also have a snowmobile trail that goes across Lake of the Woods. So you can stay in Minnesota; you don't have to deal with border credentials at all. It's a, basically a forty two mile trail. It's groomed. It's staked. It's a very nice trail, and it goes from both the southwest corner of the lake by, by War Road and, and Arneson's Rocky Point in that area, um, all the way up that way. The main trail goes from the mouth of, of uh, the Rainy River, Wheeler's Point, just north of Bidette. In fact, most of the winter, you can take that trail right from Bidette because the trail goes on the Rainy River 12 miles up to Wheeler's Point. But you can take that trail and, and it goes straight up to the Northwest Angle Resorts. Again, very nice trail, very well marked, etc. That's one way to get up there. Um, that, that you don't have to travel through Canada. Another way, the Lake of the Woods Passenger Service. So there's a service that was has been running all summer with charter boats that'll take you and your guests, you know, up to the Northwest Angle, whichever resort you want to stay at. And then when you're ready to come home, the boat will bring you back as well. Well, they do the same thing with bombardiers. So the, the Lake of the Woods Passenger Service will take you via bombardier all the way up to whatever resort you're staying, and then they'll they'll take you back when your trip is over. Another way that popped up because of necessity was Lake Country Air. Now, Lake Country Air is a fly-in service out of uh, the Duluth area. They set up a new base over on Lake of the Woods because there was a need for it. So now, you know, Lake Country Air will fly you across the lake. It's a 10 to 15 minute flight up to the Northwest Angle. It's simple. You fly up there, 
the Atlanta, of course, with floats in the water in the summertime and on the ice, they have skis that they land on. And they got uh, plowed runways up there in different parts of the angle so they can land up there and uh, get you right to your resort. So there are many ways to get up to the northwest angle. And I'll tell you what, man, you know, you, you know, there's a every part of a lake of the woods is is special in its own right. Certainly when you get up to the northwest angle, it's a very special place. It's it's where the I mentioned the 14,552 islands begin. You're fishing more structure when you're up there because that's where the kind of the glacial shield begins. So there is more structure on the lake to fish. Beautiful islands, fun resorts. You have some resorts that are self-serve that you stay in your own cabin and make your own meals. Then you have other resorts that have the full service amenities, the bar and restaurant and such with it. All of them provide you know, heated fish houses to rent. And and they typically up there use bombardiers where they'll take you out via bombardier out to uh, out to the fish houses. So it's uh, it's really a, a special, special place. We've been talking a lot of big picture stuff, Joe. Uh, let's get into the micro a little bit. Uh, when it comes to going up there to Lake of the Woods, do some walleye fishing, probably the most common question I get is, what's the best lures? What should I be taking up there? What should be in my tackle box when I head up to Lake of the Woods? Yeah, you know what? Um, it's a really good question. So a lot of lures work on Lake of the Woods. I'll mention a couple things. First off, it's stained water. So when I'm fishing stained water, I'm a big fan of baits that make noise. I like rattles in my baits. I like vibration if possible. Um, and then, of course, when you're when you're talking about colors, you know, the colors that traditionally work in stained water, you know, like, like one old timer told me many years ago, you can use any color you want on Lake of the Woods as long as it's gold. And, and gold is just a real good color in stained water. But I'll tell you the other ones, you know, glow white, pink, glow pink. Um, the glow green, um, you know, certainly chartreuse and orange are good colors. Um, even silver can be a good color. It's flashy. So, you know, normally uh, I'm going to work the one-two punch on Lake of the Woods. I'm going to get two lines in Minnesota. So one line you jig with and the other line, you know, you, you dead stick it. So with my jigging line, I'm either going to put on like a, one of my go-to lures lately actually has been a rapala rip and wrap. Man, I just love that lure. I like using that in a pink UV fire tiger. I like using the uh, chrome blue or the, the golden color they have. Um, and I'll put on a, you know, a, a, a rip and wrap, a medium size, maybe number four, and I'll rip that in one hole, no bait or nothing like that. I just rip that thing. And I'll tell you, uh, it does a couple of things. Number one, it, it's got, it's got great vibration when you rip it. And number two, it's got rattles in it. It's like an attractor for the whole fish house. It pulls fish in from an area around your fish house because of course, the walleye's lateral line um, will, will sense that vibration. And typically, instinctively, that means a potential meal for them. So they hone in on it. So I'll rip that. And not only will that pull fish under the house, I get a lot of fish that hit that thing. They'll, they'll hit it good. The other thing I'll tell you is when you're using any kind of aggressive lure, whether it's a, a rip and rat or a blade lure or a jig and wrap or whatever, you know, fish fish that are have a lockjaw they're in the more of a neutral mode some of those fish will just instinctively eat just they'll grab it just out, out of instinct so if it's a really really cold time or maybe it's a cold front that came through and it's real dead whatever if if i can see fish but they're real lethargic i might get on there and just start rip it i might do uh, that or i might do a reef runner cicada which is a blade bait that vibrates and i'll rip that sucker and i'll tell you not only do you pull fish and you get that reaction bite um if i'm not using a, a rip and wrap typically um, I'll, I'll maybe shift over to a jig and spoon with a rattle. And what I like to do with people in my fish house, Chris, is I like to make sure that everybody's trying something different so we can all together work together to figure out what those walleyes want that given day. Uh, some days they want a, a, a jig and spoon with a rattle on it. Some days they want a real big one. Some days they want a real small one. Sometimes they don't want that rattle at all. For whatever reason, they just want something a little bit more silent, a little more stealthy. So then, of course, I'll use a smaller jig and spoon that, that doesn't have a rattle. Normally, I'll tip my jig and spoons with either a piece of minnow head or I'll use a piece of the minnow tail. I use both. Um, I just think, you know, sometimes that tail, I'll pinch that thing off just a little ways in front of that tail. And, and it's got that backbone, a piece of spine in there. And I'll try to take my treble hook and hook it right through that piece of spine, you know, in about an inch. And then what that does is that when you jig it, it gives a little bit different action to that spoon. That tail kind of flops. It's kind of a more of a, a flop like that. Versus a jigging head is just a little bit different. You know, I know some some friends that just use jigging heads and they throw the rest of the minnow out. No, no, man. I, I try both. And there's times where we, either the jigging head or the head or the minnow or the, the tail of the minnow will actually work better. So that's what I like tipping my, tipping my jigs with 
or, or my spoons with, I should say. And then there are times too where if those fish are really, really lethargic, I'm, I might put on a small jig and I might play around with like a, a smallest minnow in my, my bucket. Maybe it's a crappie minnow. And I might just hook that baby through all the way through the body and put it on there so it looks real good. And I might just really finesse it, drop that in a little bit and shake it a little bit and just kind of finesse them a little bit. Now, um, with the jigging line, you know, one of the things is using your electronics. Whatever kind of electronics is your favorite. I happen to use Vexilar, but if you use Markham or Hummingbird or Garmin or whatever you use, great. But I'll tell you, those electronics are really helpful for helping you determine what those fish are doing, what their mood is, and how they're reacting to not only your lure, your colors, your 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 kind of your choice of bait, but also um, how you're presenting it. So if you're if you're doing something and you're watching those fish swim through and they're not reacting, change it up. So my my normal jigging cadence, Chris, is you know, jig jig and I'll hold it in the strike zone, jig jig, and then I'll sit in the strike zone for a second. To me, the strike zone in Lake of the Woods typically is about a foot off the bottom, six inches to a foot off the bottom. Will I jig it higher? Absolutely. Sometimes walleyes instinctively need to feed up and you'll get them to eat more if you put it up way above them, two feet up. But but traditionally that six inches to a foot is a strike zone for me. If they're not hitting it when I'm doing that, I'm gonna drop it in the mud or the sand or rocks, wherever I'm fishing. But I'm gonna drop it in the mud, I'm gonna lift it off. Drop it in the mud, lift it off. If they're not doing that, I'm gonna shake it like heck, just shake as fast as I can and then hold it in the strike zone. Sometimes that'll get them to go. And if they're not going out, and all these things you got to do, boom, 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 because that fish is there for a limited period of time, and it's moving on. It's going to lose interest. If they're not hitting it then, what I do is I shake it like heck, and I start reeling up. So that thing, that minnow, is like it's escaping. It's going up in the water column. And you can watch those fish chase it. And when those fish chase it, don't stop. That fish will typically lose interest and go back down. When it's chasing, you want to keep reeling and shaking, reeling and shaking. And, 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 you know, a lot of times I'll be calling to my friends or my family. I'll be like, okay, it's uh, – it's five feet off. It's 10 feet off. It's 15 feet off. Oh, there he is. You know, a lot of times when they hit you, they push you up and they give you slack. Um, so that, that often is a really good technique. You get those fish to go tease them all the way up. I used to raise my, I used to shake and raise my arms up, but then when they hit you up here, you have nothing left to set with. So I've learned to kind of use my reel handle. So then when they hit you, you, you can, you can give them a little more uh, of a hook set. So that, that's kind of what the jigging line. Now the dead stick, that's a whole another science. Traditionally, I'll put a live minnow on either a plain hook or my favorite, uh, you know, ice jig. And I'll put that down at about six inches to a foot off the bottom under either under a bobber or sometimes I don't even use a bobber. I'll, I'd like to use a bobber stop just to kind of mark where the bottom of the lake is or where I want it, where the, the proper setting is to the water line. So that way I don't have to reset it all the time. But then what I'll do is I'll either set that on the floor of the fish house or I'll set that over a bucket and I'll have kind of a lighter tip on that rod. And that lighter tip, you can sometimes even see your minnow moving, but that lighter tip is so important because what ends up happening is when those fish are light biting, a lot of times they're just going to pull that thing down just a tad. Really hard to see in your bobbers, even if they're set right, you know, real finesse way. But th they'll just pull that down and, oh boy, I tell you, I'll feel that way down and pop them right there. And you'll get a lot of extra fish that way. I learned that one of the, uh, one of the local guys I was fishing once with once, he was setting his rod on the bucket with just a jig head and a minnow. That's all it was. And I was doing the traditional one, two, you know, the, the two phase approach, right? The, the one, two punch. And I was jigging and I had my bobber down and I caught a few fish, but I didn't catch as many as he did. He was watching that rod tip and that rod tip would go down just a little bit. He picked that sucker up and he'd have a fish on there. I just wonder how many fish I was missing. Yeah, having that dead stick with you is definitely a, a good way. And it's something that I, when I talk to a lot of guides, they talk about, you know, people, a lot of times, you know, when we talk about leaving money on the table, so they, they leave fish on the table because, you know, you can fish with two lines legally and so many people just fish with one line. So getting that extra line in the water can make a big difference. And I think when you're doing what we're talking about, which is jigging walleye, a lot of times, yeah, you're right. A jigging rod brings them in, but they, they like to hit that dead stick. What do you typically have on your dead stick? What are you using for, for minnow or for bait there on the dead stick? Yeah, good question. You know what? I, uh, a couple of things I like using. Uh, I like using uh, a jig a bit. Uh, I like using those quite a bit. It's just kind of that, that, uh, call, that call hook that's kind of with a you know, piece of lead on it that's colored. I like using that in like a, a pink and white or a gold. Um, I like using those, uh, gosh, I think they're called, uh, I'm going to forget the name now. But they're, they're almost like a big crappie jig. They glow in the dark. They're almost like a, I think a phantom or something. Um, but but they're actually a big crappie jig and they, they're glow in the dark. And I like using those sometimes. Otherwise, you know what? 
I do so good on just a plain hook. A plain hook works real good. You know, another one I kind of like using, I've, I've used in the last few years is uh, uh, Snyder's has something called a flying ant out. And I, I like using that flying ant just because it has a propeller on it and it's got some good glow colors on it. And when I pull that thing up, that propeller spins. You know, one thing I'll say about a dead stick is it's good to typically keep them moving. You know, you want to keep that middle moving. You want to keep it active. If you keep it active and just let it sit for a while, but keep it active, you're going to catch more fish typically. Um, I will mention I uh, I use both, you know, fat heads and, you know, emerald shiners if they are available. And, you, you know, one day it doesn't matter which one you use. And other days that emerald shiners seem to be the ticket. Uh, I'll never forget the time I was fishing with my, uh, um, somebody used to work with me, Jace Luoma. And, you know, Jace, he, we were filming a, a TV show. <laughs> and of all things, he went for the dead emerald shiners in the minnow bucket. He put on a, a dead emerald shiner on his dead stick. And I'll tell you, he caught more fish than all of us did on that dead minnow. For whatever reason, you know, that dead minnow was a ticket that day. I don't know if they were just that lethargic or just the instinctiveness of being a scavenger, if they can be. I, I don't know what it was. But well, I'll tell you, after watching him do that, I uh, I kept that one in the back pocket. That's for sure. Yeah, dead minnows don't run away. Yeah, no, they don't do that. No, <laughs> that's right. A, a really good. You, you, uh... said something, you said something really important, though, is that, you know, for people that only use one line, Man, get that bonus line down, you know, even if it's a rattle reel or something, just get a good lively minnow on there and put that baby. And the other thing is, you know, even if you're going to use two dead sticks because you don't want to fish that hard or you just want to relax and just have the, the lines down, or whatever, you know, set one down at uh, six inches to a foot, set another one three feet off. There's many a times where, you know, I'll be uh, jigging with a line and I'll maybe go to reach to get something or do something. And I set my line just momentarily on a chair or something. So my jigging spoons, three, four or five feet off the bottom. I cannot tell you how many times these fish that I've been fishing for the last hour, all of a sudden one will rise up. You'll see it rise slowly and I'll watch my rod tip go boom. For whatever reason, you know, sometimes when you suspend that thing, it, it, it triggers them because I think they're used to feeding up for schools of minnows. So again, you know, don't be afraid to, even if you're dead stick fishing, try different things with your two dead sticks. Yeah, one of the things that, that you've been talking about sitting on a bucket, but also being able to jig. One of the really handy tools uh, that I use is the catch cover rod rod holder. And that has kind of like an arm. You can put it however you want over the hole. And then what I like about it is it holds that rod and I can just tap it once in a while. and It'll do that jig for you. You don't even have to pick up the rod. So that's a really handy deal. Well, it's uh, also nice too because you don't have to worry about the rod going on the hole. And the rod doesn't go down the hole either. That's exactly right. Yeah. So yep. uh, super handy to be able to kind of just tap that rod once in a while to jig it, even though, you, you know, it's more of a dead stick, but it just gives you a little action once in a while. You don't even That's have cool. to pick up the rod. You just tap it and it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe, we got one more question here out there. And this one is uh, from YouTube. And he says, assuming you can get to the angle with your wheelhouse, are there any resorts in the Northwest angle that cater to private wheelhouses? Uh, yeah, no, you, you really, uh, it really is you know, tough to get to the angle with your wheelhouse. Most people don't bring wheelhouses because they're, you know, up at the angle, all the roads up there are simply resort roads. There's no real public roads where, you know, you necessarily pay a fee and go fish like the South end. It's just a little bit different up there. So up there, um, there really aren't the public roads like they're on the South end. You know, really the wheelhouses are all on the South end of the lake and, and up at the angle, it's uh, um, the, the only, the only ice road there is up there is called the resort road and the Island resorts chip in on it. And what it is, it's a way to get from the mainland, which is Angle Inlet, out to the different island resorts, both on Flag and, and Oak Island. But it's not a road that, that you're allowed to um, to fish off of, et cetera. They don't, they don't give passes out for wheelhouses up at the Angle. Just a little bit different area. They have, like I said, they have all bombers up there taking people out to fish houses. Otherwise, people are fishing on their own, and they're using collapsibles and snowmobiles. All right, Joe, I know you could talk about Lake of the Woods all day long, but uh, we're going to wrap it up. Is there something that you wanted to talk about today that I didn't ask you about? Well, you know, I would just say this, you know, um, you, you know, there's a lot of ways to get her done. You know, some people um, don't have the ice equipment and, and they're just getting into ice fishing. Or maybe they wanted to bring their their spouse or go up with a family trip. You know, one of the nice things about Lake of the Woods is that, you know, you can go up to a resort, you know, the fish house is on the fish. It's heated. The holes are drilled. You know, either you can drive yourself or they'll drive you on the ice all the way out to the fish house. Certainly not cold because, you know, it's actually a more of a controlled environment than fishing in a boat. In a boat, you have wind and rain and snow and sleet and whatever else. You know, if it's 20 below zero, 
you know, you can go out on a heated vehicle to, to within four steps of the fish house, park right outside the fish house and step inside the door and it's 70 degrees and you take your jacket off. It's, it's just like fishing in a living room. So the days of ice fishing and freezing your buns off are gone. You know, as you know, Chris, the, the ice fishing is enjoyable. It's also why we're getting older people into it. We're getting families into it. There's a lot of different people that are enjoying ice fishing. Um, you know, ice fishing is a very social activity. So yeah, you know, some people are hardcore and really want to catch fish and some people want to catch a few fish, but there's a lot more of the social part of it going on. You know, the, the families, the buddies, the, the reunions, the girls trips, uh, uh, bachelor parties, bachelorette parties, you know, things like that, uh, business groups, you know, where else can you be with some customers or whatever the case might be in a nice heated fish house for eight hours, just, uh, catching fish, having a few of your favorite beverages and, uh, just having a nice time. It's special that way. It's, it's, it's being out on a frozen lake for me, heck the colder and the windier and the crappier, almost the better. It's real cozy in that fish house. It's just real nice. So really what I want to emphasize is that, you know, to, to enjoy ice fishing in today's world, you don't have to be a hardcore ice angler. You don't have to have the equipment. You don't have to know much about it. You can go out there and have a level of success and have a very, very nice time. Um, and, and enjoy, you know, enjoy a winter activity that's really uh, uh, native to the ice belt. And, you know, Lake of the Woods isn't the only place. There's a lot of great lakes in the Midwest you can go ice fishing. And I encourage you to get out there and enjoy it, man. It, it, it's, it's great getting outside in the winter. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, the creature comforts now. You don't have to freeze. The equipment is getting so good now. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to get out to one of the ice fishing shows, do that as well. You can kind of see everything on display and what it looks like. And uh, I'm looking forward to the St. Paul show and getting on the floor with uh, a lot of these resorts too and, and seeing them and kind of seeing what they're all about and seeing some of the new gear and, and everything else that's going on and surrounding that. So Joe, really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing your thoughts and your knowledge with us. And the cool thing about you is you know the area super well, but you also uh, know fishing very well too. So it's great to have you on. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Chris. And I, I wish everybody a great, great season. And Chris, I uh, look forward to seeing you at the St. Paul Ice Show.